Hello, my name is Larry Nichols, William Hutton Senior Curator of European and American Painting and Sculpture before 1900 here at the Toledo Museum of Art. I stand in front of Rembrandt's painting, a small work on loan to us that we're very proud to have here until May 1st. It's on copper. It measures only eight and a half inches by about six and three quarter inches. It's quite small. It's generously on loan to us from, the, from a private collector, courtesy of Hazlitt, Gooden and Fox Limited in London. It's a beautiful object and I'm very keen to tell you a little bit about it. The painting depicts Rembrandt himself seen in half length from about the waist up, one arm with the elbow aiming toward us, defining space by so doing. His head is tilted back, his face is brightly illuminated, he's laughing. He's wearing a purple garment with a brown uh, sash across his midsection, slung over his left shoulder as well. And at his neck, he's wearing a piece of armor, rather curiously, a gorget. We're not certain why he's representing himself with that artifact on, but so is Rembrandt. A few remarks about the biography of Rembrandt van Rijn. He was born in 1606 in Leiden and died in 1669 in Amsterdam. He was the son of a miller. The family of his mother had as a profession baking. That is to say, he didn't, therefore, come from a family of, uh, with a history of painting and the arts. He went to the Latin school in Leiden, learned the classics, uh, the classical subjects, learned a great deal about the Bible to be sure, and at approximately age 15 or 16 he, he left that study and went to take lessons to train as a painter, working first with a uh, teacher in Leiden and then a six-month apprenticeship with an artist named Peter Lastman in Amsterdam. He returns to Leiden, practices by 1627 or so, perhaps a little bit earlier, uh, art on his own. The painting that we wonderfully have on loan here, in fact, is datable about to the year 1628. Three years after that, he moves to Amsterdam for good. He never returned to Leiden in a permanent way. In fact, he never traveled out of the Netherlands. This is how self-confident Rembrandt was. In the economic center of the Netherlands, Amsterdam, Rembrandt immediately made great renown and, and wealth for himself as a portraitist, as a painter of history subjects, that is to say, uh, scenes of mythology, uh, scenes from the Bible, both Old and New Testaments, he made uh, renderings of, of landscapes, made a very few number of, of still lives, and he also painted scenes of everyday life that he witnessed about Holland from his waking and, and activities day by day. He was a printmaker, he was a draftsman, and he was a great painter. With Franz Hals and Johannes Vermeer, Rembrandt van Rijn was the greatest artist of the 17th century. Some might even say the greatest artist ever. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the recent reappearance of this picture that we have on loan here, Rembrandt laughing, for it's quite an astounding and amazing story. As you see here, the composition of Rembrandt's painting on loan to us is known from a Flemish engraving made by Lambertus Antonius Clausens, a Flemish artist, as I said, who lived from 1763 to 1834. Clausens' inscription on his print identifies the work as coming from the hand of Franz Hals. We know that now not to be the case, as Rembrandt painted this, but this is a record then of this painting existing in the late 18th or early 19th century. It next appears in the art historical literature in the early 19th century, where it is listed as lost Rembrandt painting known from the Clausen's print. And it reappears on two subsequent occasions in the 20th century exactly that way. Then, in a provincial auction in England on the 26th of October 2007, the painting reappears. It does so as follower of Rembrandt, listed with an extremely small estimate. It made a very big price. 
At least two bidders therefore recognize the painting for what it is, a genuine Rembrandt. For the duration of the generous loan of Rembrandt laughing to the Toledo Museum of Art, we've installed the picture between our own two Rembrandt paintings. Let me tell you a little about each of them and then I'll return to the fine small copper behind me. You see here Rembrandt's young man with a plumed hat, monogrammed and dated 1631. It's painted on panel. It was acquired by this museum's founder, Edward Drummond Libby, in 1906 and left to our collection at his death in 1925. When Libby acquired this painting, scholars considered it to be a self-portrait by Rembrandt. Doubt about this identification was raised by 1936, and since then it's merely been called an unknown man. In fact, it may not have been intended as an identifiable portrait. It might be a trony, a Dutch word simply for a study of a face. It was painted in Amsterdam in the months after he moved there from Leiden in 1631. We see here opulence and a specific but transient moment of time. The figure has a gold chain around his neck, dangling from it a pendant with a jewel on it. He wears a velvet cap with a gray feather. There's a dynamism to the composition constructed deliberately by the artist with the left shoulder projecting forward slightly and the feather projecting back into space. These elements in conjunction with Rembrandt's wonderful light the ambient light around the figure enveloping the form is what makes this picture so memorable. The Toledo Museum of Art is very fortunate in having a second painting by Rembrandt, Man in a Fur-Lined Coat. This picture was bought by this institution in 1977 and it makes a grand juxtaposition with our earlier portrait. In this painting datable to 1655 to 1660, hence towards the end of the artist's career, and that's the wonderful juxtaposition with Toledo's painting of 1631. We see a man in three-quarter length, frontally positioned, gazing, even peering out at us. He has a brilliant red garment on, long locks of hair dangle over his shoulders. His hand is rested on a article girdling him, probably a belt. There are other details in this, but there's not enough to identify what Rembrandt may have had in mind here. Is it a portrait? Is it a portrait historie? That is to say, a known individual in the guise of a mythological figure, or perhaps even more likely, an Old Testament figure? We simply don't know. There's always more to learn when one is dealing with a genius. It's a late painting, and stylistically we see the breadth of Rembrandt's execution here glowing colors, again an enveloping light, but it's a broader touch rather than the minute application of brush strokes that generally characterizes the early Rembrandt. There's a stillness and a vitality in this picture that's quite mesmerizing. Returning now to Rembrandt laughing, let's discuss a little bit how scholars have come to recognize this as a painting from the hand of Rembrandt. Credit goes to Rembrandt scholar Ernst von der Wetering, emeritus professor, University of Amsterdam, primarily for this attribution, for it's he who's published in the Chronicle of the Rembrandt House in 2007 his defense of this painting as from the hand of Rembrandt. One would think his argument is cut and dry for the fact that the copper is monogrammed R-H-L, Rembrandt Harmanson, his middle name, Le from Leiden. But of course, somebody else could have affixed that monogram. Professor van der Vedering has demonstrated that whoever put it on there, and he's certain it's Rembrandt having done so, the application of it is wet paint into wet paint. So it's not from a later time. So there's one point buttressing the argument. Another is that the painting on copper is a support that Rembrandt used a number of times in his early Leiden years. It also was exactly the time he was working as a printmaker, commencing his long and fabulous career as an etcher. In fact, his earliest signed and dated etching is 1628, the year this thought this painting dates from. 
X-ray examination of this copper has revealed that underneath the rendering of Rembrandt, there is an unfinished painting of a number of figures that very likely is a history painting, a mythological or biblical painting. We're not sure what, but again, in these years, 1627, 28, Rembrandt was making such paintings and possibly he commenced such a subject for whatever reason, decided not to continue, maybe turned the painting 90 degrees and renders what we're looking at. So the superimposed painting on top of what's underneath, very likely being another Rembrandt there, unfinished, is another point that supports this attribution. Now let's take a look at the subject itself. The artist has shown himself laughing. You see here an etching laughing man from 1630, not only in oils then, but in his etchings. Rembrandt at this very time was exploring the emotions, the capturing of a face in laughter or in surprise or other emotions as well. And one theory is, and it's highly plausible, is that this painting, perhaps this etching that we've been looking at too, were made as exercises for Rembrandt to explore how to render a countenance responding in a certain emotional state. We see examples of such faces then in history paintings where a figure will be in pain or in great joy and very likely Rembrandt using his own countenance, his own facial features, looking in a mirror was making studies of exactly these kinds of responses. Connoisseurship, which is what I'm talking about, ultimately, however, boils down to lots of looking and experience. And Ernst von der Vedering's phrase, spontaneous sensitivity of handling, is probably the strongest argument for being certain this picture is painted by the young genius Rembrandt. Whether Rembrandt wanted us to see this as a self-portrait or not, categorically represents Rembrandt. Laughing, the artist exploring a joyous emotion. In some 75 instances in his long career, in prints, in drawings, in paintings, Rembrandt did render his own likeness. I'd like to show you just a few others to give you a greater sense of how he depicted himself. You're looking at painting in the Indianapolis Museum of Art, Study in a Mirror. And again, we see Rembrandt. It's from just a year or two later than the painting on loan to the Toledo Museum of Art. And it's on panel, slightly larger, but again, an artist exploring perhaps the least expensive model available to him, his own likeness. Here's another painting also from 1629, Trony with Rembrandt's features is how the painting will get cataloged these days. Trony being that Dutch word for face. And so we're seeing here Rembrandt's likeness in another panel, again, slightly larger than the lone copper to Toledo. And the similarities in the facial features are showing us Rembrandt at a young age. He's approximately 22 or 23 in the lone painting to us. and a, about the same age then in the Indianapolis and Nuremberg painting. Let's look at how he records his likeness towards the end of his life. I remind you he dies in 1669. This painting that you see now, self-portrait as Zuxis laughing, is in the museum in Cologne, Germany. For a long while it was thought to be datable to the very last year of Rembrandt's life, 1669. Recent scholarship puts it now, some seven years earlier, to about 1662. That is to say, there are a number of self-portraits that post-date the painting in Cologne. Zuxis was a classical painter who laughed himself to death while painting an old woman. At the left margin of this painting, you see Rembrandt having painted a painting of an old woman. It's not fully legible, but in the original, it is. That stick in front of the artist is actually a mall stick, an implement used by the painter as he's working in front on, on a canvas. Now in Rembrandt's day, in the literature of Rembrandt's day, Zuxis was praised as one who always chose subjects that allowed him to depict the passions and emotions. 
You see Rembrandt here laughing, in fact, laughing himself to death as Xuxes. It's a remarkable juxtaposition then with Rembrandt 1627 or 8 in the painting on loan to us, the small copper, as a young man. Here again, either coincidentally, accidentally, we again see the master laughing. He's a profound artist, a universal artist, and I think it's a great opportunity to see this self-portrait here on loan to the Toledo Museum, for it highlights our own gems, a painting from the early years of Rembrandt's career in 1631, and a painting from the last years of the 1650s, a great picture that I wish we knew more about. If you're watching this before May 1st, 2011, I can't urge you enough to come to the Toledo Museum of Art and see Rembrandt laughing on loan to this institution. If you're viewing this after May 1st of 2011, still come to the Toledo Museum of Art because we can reward you with two very fine Rembrandt paintings that I've discussed with you here 